I just. That's pretty cool. That's adorable. Yeah. She's good like that. Good morning. Years ago, I was teaching at a Bible college and I did a class on communication, and I gave her an illustration. I had a bag of trinkets, stupid stuff I got from like a Dollar Tree, and then I got verses in another bag, and they had to grab a trinket and grab a verse and put that together as a sermon illustration. If you look at your handout, please look at the title today. The sermon title is Gouge Out Your Eye. Gouge Your Eyes Out, Eye Out. By the way, if Steve asked for volunteers, <laughs> just saying I wouldn't do it. We're so thankful to have people like Steve because I believe that Steve is a great preacher. Let's go ahead and stand up. We're so thankful. So good to be in your house and we're so thankful for the blessings you give us 
Father, to change the seasons, just the way you just watch over us and take care of us. We're so thankful. We're blessed to be here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated if you like.
sank through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it. When He returns to wipe away our tears. There will be a day when all of us
King David went through a time in his life when he really, really needed the Lord and was so grateful to have it. From Psalms it says, The Lord lives, and blessed is my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is he who avenges me. He delivers me from my enemies and lifts me up above those who have risen up against me. Therefore will I give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the unbelievers, and sing praises to your name. For great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed. Father, we have raised up our hallelujahs to you in song this morning. And Father, we know it's not much compared to all you have done for us. But Father, we lift them up with hearts of joy, with hearts of gratitude for the awesome God you are. And Lord, we know that there will be a day when we will all bow before you. And with angels and the saints, we will give a mighty roar of praise and glory to you. Father, we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, Lord, we pray that you will accept our, our meager efforts of praise and that they will be a, a sweet aroma lifted up to you. That you will see our hearts are full of love and gratitude for you, for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Father, this morning as we worship together, I want to take just a moment to, to thank you for putting people in our lives who are so self-giving. I think particularly this morning of our veterans who have made such sacrifices, Lord, to protect the freedoms of people they don't even know. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with our troops, our troops who are actively serving, but I also pray, Lord, that your blessings will be upon those who have already done their tour of service. Lord, we have many veterans in our church, and I thank you for them, and I pray your blessings upon them, that they will know that their service is greatly appreciated. Father, I pray that you'll be with our country right now. There's much turmoil in our world, Lord, and 
We just lift our nation, our world up to you, Lord. We pray that you'll be with our leaders. Help them make wise decisions. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with your church. Help us to rise up and, and speak the truth in love to a world that has gone so far off the rails. Father, we pray for revival in our land. Lord, we ask that for the remainder of this service, our hearts will be open and in tune with you, that you will speak through the message today, Lord, to teach us, to guide us, to help us draw closer to Jesus and know what we need to do to become more like him. That is our prayer. In his name we ask it. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever said something and then immediately wish you could just take those words and put them right back in your mouth? This is a, a book of devotions. It's actually written by my grandma Ruthie. And I believe there's a copy of this book in the church library if you're interested. But anyway, uh, most of the devotions in this book are actually stories grandma wrote about different family members. There's even a story in here about me when I was three years old. But that's the story for another time. The story I want to share with you today is actually about my mom. Before mom and dad married, she was a nurse's aide in a hospital and she enjoyed that work immensely. And grandma uh, accurately describes my mom when she said that she was vivacious, generous to a fault, never sees a stranger, cheerful, and possesses a most winsome personality. So that was my mom. And on this particular day, she was trying to cheer up a patient that seemed to be very depressed. So she began her pep talk, Grandma writes, by telling the patient how well he looked. And in her opinion, he would soon be going home. This brought no response. So she continued to tell him what a beautiful winter day it was. Snow and the promise of more snow. She said, I'm having so much fun this winter. And the first thing you know, you'll be out of here in just tip-top shape. And you'll go ice skating. Oh, it's ideal now for skating. I dearly love to skate, don't you? Later on in the day, Betty, that was my mom, was asked to take this young man to the solarium. And as she assisted the patient into a wheelchair, she realized for the first time that he wouldn't be skating on the pond. One of his legs was missing. And my mom wished that she had never said what she did to that patient. It happens to all of us. We, we all have those times where we say things we wish we hadn't said. Things like, oh, don't worry, you can stay for as long as you want. <laughs> right? Or that's okay, we'll just put it on the credit card. Right? Or I think I'll have a third bowl of that bean soup. Yeah, you can regret that. Yeah. Or uh, how about this one? It's okay. You can tell me anything. Ever regret saying that? Well, it shouldn't surprise us that people sometimes say things they wish they'd never said. But what may be surprising is to learn that Jesus said them some things that we may wish he never said. That's right. The perfect son of God. The one who said so many things that I'm glad he said. Things like, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. I'm glad Jesus said that. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What a great thing for Jesus to say. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come back and take you to be with me. Man, I am so glad Jesus said that. But there are other things Jesus said that are much, much harder to hear. Things that are difficult to understand and even more difficult to follow. Now these aren't the verses that we tend to memorize. These aren't verses that we're going to see engraved on a plaque in someone's living room. Or shared in a Facebook meme. Or held up on a sign in the end zone at a football game. Or tattooed onto somebody's body. These are verses that we tend to, to skirt around. Skip over. Because they're just so confusing. 
And if we do take the time to ponder them and, and to understand them, they sometimes make us squirm a little bit. Because something inside of us says, gee, I wish Jesus hadn't said that. Ministers even avoid preaching sermons on these verses because they are such hard teachings. But I don't think Jesus made these statements to be ignored. I don't think they're included in Scripture just to be passed over. So for the next few weeks, we're going to explore some of these hard sayings of Jesus. They're sayings that when you first hear them, might leave you thinking, I wish Jesus hadn't said that. But my prayer is, as we better come to understand these teachings, we will gain a deeper appreciation for them. And maybe even find ourselves glad that Jesus said them. Today we begin with a passage in Matthew 5, where Jesus is giving his famous Sermon on the Mount. And he addresses what we must do to escape sinful behavior. He says in verses 29 and 30, If your right eye causes you to sin, and before we go on, let me just ask you, does your eye ever cause you to sin? Do you ever find yourself looking with envy at something someone else has that you want? Do you ever find yourself looking into someone else's business when it's none of your own? Do you ever find yourself reading books or watching movies that are filled with vulgarity? Do you ever look at your computer or look on your phone at pornography? Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, and he goes on that verse says, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Wow, that sounds harsh. But he's not done. He goes on to say, and if your right hand causes you to sin. So let's pause right there. Does that ever apply to you? Have you ever used your hand to take something that wasn't yours? Or to lash out violently when you became angry? Or to fudge the numbers on an expense report? Or to make a rude gesture to that car that cut you off on the highway? At least we're honest here, right? Have you ever used your hand to, on a date, to touch someone inappropriately in a way that only a spouse should be touched? Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Wow. Is, is Jesus serious here? I mean, this is a hard teaching. Because if Jesus meant this, the way it sounds on the surface, then we should all be wearing eye patches and we should all be left-handed, right? And if Jesus didn't mean it that way, then exactly what does he mean when he says this? Well, let's see if we can figure that out. What was Jesus really trying to teach us about escaping the, the sin of lust in particular that Jesus addresses here, but also... It applies to all other sinful behavior. How do we escape it? Well, first of all, I believe Jesus was telling us that to avoid falling into the trap of sin, we must first of all understand the origin of sin. We need to know where sin originates. In verse 27 he says, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now, where would they have heard that before? The Old Testament. You might remember that that was the seventh of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. It's in Exodus 20:14, And it's a very straightforward command, isn't it? Do not commit adultery. Can't get much simpler than that, right? At least that's what the Jewish leaders were teaching. You see, they believed as long as you didn't actually physically have sex with someone else's spouse, you were not guilty of breaking this command. But that often left the door wide open for just about anything else. What if the woman you were sleeping with wasn't someone else's spouse, but not yours either? Is that okay? And if it was someone else's spouse, well, how physically intimate could you get before you were guilty of breaking this command? 
You see, the way the Jews looked at it, you could get by with all kinds of sexual promiscuity without breaking this command. But once you actually crossed over the line, and the minute you actually engaged in sex with someone else's spouse, then the penalty for that was death. And there's a lot of adultery going on back in Jesus' day. The Roman men were especially notorious for having mistresses. The prevailing attitude at that time in Rome was as long as a man supported his wife and children, there was no shame in having marital affairs. But any Jew who took it that far stood to be executed for their sin. And that probably seemed like a very moral, very upright interpretation of the seventh commandment considering all the promiscuity that was going on around them. You'll be put to death if you take another man's wife or if you take another woman's husband. But other than that, anything goes. Well, then Jesus comes along and he exposes their misguided thinking. He tells them, you've heard that it was said... Do not commit adultery. And then he goes on in verse 28. And he says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Notice here how much authority Jesus is speaking with. A lot. He says, The Ten Commandments may say this, but I say... Wow. So is Jesus saying that the Ten Commandments are wrong. And he was right. Moses was wrong. But I am right. Is he discrediting the Ten Commandments? No. No, not at all. In fact, just a few verses earlier, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus was saying, You guys are familiar with the letter of the law, but you have totally missed the meaning of and the spirit of the law. And since Jesus is God. Since he is the word become flesh. That means Jesus as the author of the law. Is qualified to expand on its meaning. So he explains to them. That the sin of adultery. Is not committed only when a man or woman. Sleeps with someone else's spouse. He says that sin is committed the moment you lust after that person in your heart. He wanted his listeners, he wants us to understand that the origin of sin is not in your actions. But sin originates in your heart and in your mind. That's where it originates. You see, Jesus was getting down to the root of adultery, and quite frankly, the root of all sin, which is the spiritual condition of our heart and our mind. He's explaining that a lustful heart is the real sin, not just the physical act of adultery itself. And the word lust here, it simply means an overwhelming desire or craving for anything God forbids. That's lust. An overwhelming desire or craving for anything God forbids. And those desires, those cravings, where do they begin? Right here. Right here. In our heart, in our head. That's where sin originates. There's an old saying, I'm sure many of you have heard it, but I love it. Sow a thought, reap a deed. Sow a deed, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle, sow a lifestyle, reap a destiny. But where does it all start? Right here. Where you sow a thought in your mind, in your heart. The Bible puts it this way in James 1, 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Reynold III is recorded in history. He's a 14th century duke that uh, was in an area which is now Belgium. And Reynold was grossly overweight. In fact, he was often called by his Latin nickname Crassus, which means fat. And Reynold had a younger brother named Edward. 
And after a violent argument between these brothers, Edward successfully overthrew Reynold. And once he did that, instead of um, having him executed, what Edward did instead was he built another room on the castle around his brother Reynold. But this room was different than the other rooms in the castle. Instead of the, the big double doors that are real high and wide that you see in castles, instead of the high arching windows that you see in the rest of the castle, this room just had basically normal sized windows and doors. And Edward told his brother, you can have your freedom, you can have your position back as soon as you can leave that room. That would have been easy for you and me because there were no locks on the doors or the windows. So you or I, we could have just walked right out. Had our freedom. But not Reynold. Because he was so big, he could not fit through a normal sized door. If he wanted his freedom, he needed to lose weight. But Edward knew his older brother. So each day he sent a variety of delicious foods to Reynold's room. So instead of dieting his way to freedom, Reynold just grew bigger and heavier and bigger and heavier. And whenever his brother was accused of cruelty, he had a ready answer. My brother's not a prisoner. He can leave anytime he so wills. So Reynold stayed in that room for 10 years and wasn't released until after Edward died. But then after that, his health was, was so ruined by that time, he died within a year. A prisoner of his own appetite. And I think many of us are like Reynold. Trapped by our own appetites, our own sinful desires. And, and we all have desires. We, we all deal with temptation. But if we give them to the Lord, then he will help us overcome those temptations. I like the way the New Living Translation words a promise found in 1 Corinthians 10.13. Where it says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. So we can't use the excuse, well God it was just too, uh, irresistible, I just couldn't help myself. God says, no, I'm not going to send a temptation your way that is more than you can stand. When you are tempted... He will show you a way out so you can endure. So if we will take our temptations, if we'll take our desires to God, he will help us adjust our thinking. He'll, he'll help us resist so that we can keep our heart pure. But if we allow those thoughts and those temptations to linger in our mind, take root in our heart, then those desires that we have will soon have us. I think I mentioned in a sermon not long ago that this was what I see one of the biggest differences between David and Joseph in the Old Testament. You might remember that Joseph was seduced by Potiphar's wife and he fled from her. David saw Bathsheba bathing and he fixated on her. Joseph was around Potiphar's wife day in and day out. He was a guy, she was a beautiful woman. I'm sure there were several occasions when they were alone together. And I think it's safe to assume that she at least flirted with him several times before she actually tried to get him into bed with her. But I believe that Joseph refused to entertain any such thoughts of being with her in his mind. He might have glanced at her long enough to notice how attractive she was. But then he quickly turned his eyes away. He turned his mind onto other matters, refusing to let that sin originate in his mind. David, on the other hand, he was out walking on his roof, which back then was probably more like a balcony. And he looked out. He just happened to catch a sight of Bathsheba bathing, probably on another rooftop. And at that point, after he had glanced at her beauty, unlike Joseph... He didn't turn his eyes away. He didn't turn his mind onto other things. David allowed his glance to become a gaze. He began to entertain thoughts of being with her. He probably had thoughts like, well, just because I can't sleep with her doesn't mean I can't peek at her, right? 
I might fantasize about being with her, but that's not the same as actually doing it, right? Nobody's even going to know, so no harm done, right? Wrong. When David's glance became a gaze, he began sowing thoughts. And those thoughts, those thoughts sowed seeds of sin in his heart. And those seeds reaped sinful deeds. David sent for Bathsheba. He slept with her. And then he had her husband murdered to cover up his sin when she got pregnant. Jesus wanted us to understand what David apparently didn't understand. If we're going to escape sinful behavior, we need to recognize where sin originates. Not with our actions, but with our attitudes, with our ambitions. It starts in the heart. Then once we understand the origin of sin, Jesus says the next thing we must do to escape the trap of sin is we must remove the source of sin. Remove the source. And to emphasize this point, that's where Jesus makes this very shocking statement. Let's look at it again. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. This statement, for me, is much harder for me to, to think about since my brother Mark developed a cancerous tumor on his dominant arm a few months ago. And the longer that tumor was there, the more it grew, the more painful it became. And doctors recognized that that tumor's got to go. So they went in to take out the tumor, and once they got in there, they realized that it wasn't going to be enough to take out the tumor because the cancer would continue to spread and it would kill him. And so they made the decision to amputate his arm at the shoulder, his dominant arm. And I've had several conversations with Mark since then and he is recovering nicely. But let me tell you, it is more difficult than you can even imagine to lose your dominant arm. It, it affects your balance when you get up to walk. There are phantom pains that just randomly pop up that are they're very uncomfortable. You, you'll forget. You'll, you'll reach down to pick up a box and suddenly be reminded that, hey, that takes two arms to pick that up, and I've only got one. You'll go to get food off your plate with your fork, and you can't get the food to stay on your fork on your plate just to take it up to your mouth. Think it'd be easy, but you realize, no, you use that other hand more than you think you do. It's very difficult. But consider the alternative. Either lose a limb and live or keep it and die. You know, Mark's still adjusting, but he's happy to be alive. He's happy to be cancer free. So which choice would you make? You ever thought about that? Have you ever considered what you would do if you were called to make that sort of a decision? Lose a limb or lose your life? What would you decide? Well, the truth is, all of us have been called to make that sort of a decision. Because the cancer of sin leads to spiritual death. So Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin the way it did David, when he gazed at Bathsheba, cut it out. If your hand causes you to sin the way David's did when he took Bathsheba for himself, cut it off. Better to be blind, better to be maimed than to die in your sins. Now, please be clear here. Let me, let me make sure you understand that Jesus is not speaking literally here. He's using hyperbole. He's exaggerating. He's overstating to make his point. We use hyperbole all the time. We say things like, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Right? Or it's raining cats and dogs out there. Just before the service, uh, we held hands to pray with the praise team. And I was next to Harmony. And after we prayed, I said, I think I got frostbite from holding Harmony's cold hand. That's hyperbole, right? We use it all the time. And Jesus was doing the same thing here to illustrate that if we want to escape sinful behavior, sometimes we have to take drastic action. 
Sometimes it requires drastic measures. We might need to cut some things out of our lives. Things we want. Things that we value. Things we've come to depend on even. And Jesus uses this extreme image of gouging out your eye or, or cutting off your hand to, to emphasize the fact that it doesn't matter what it is. If it is the hook Satan is using to reel you into sin, then you need to eliminate that from your life. Whatever it is. The origin of sin is in the heart. And the eye is the window to the heart. So if you have an overwhelming desire to look at something you shouldn't, that is lust. And when that happens, you don't literally need to remove your eye from your body. But what you do need to do is you literally need to remove your eye from that source of temptation that is causing you to lust. That might mean putting a filter on your computer. It, it might mean staying away from your cell phone for a while. Whatever it means, that's what you need to do. If you have an overwhelming desire to do something, God would not want you to do. You don't need to literally cut off your hand from your arm. But you do need to remove your hand far from whatever it is that's planting those thoughts in your mind. Mark had to literally have his arm cut off to save his life from cancer. And Jesus is telling us that we may need to cut some things out of our lives in order to free ourselves from the cancer of some kind of sin. You might think you can't live without whatever it is because you've come to depend on it. But the reality is you can't continue to live spiritually with it. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks specifically about the cancer of adultery. But this principle applies to any sin that might infect your life. It could be the cancer of materialism, or the cancer of pride, or the cancer of ambition. We see an example of this in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus makes a statement very similar to the one here in our text this morning, but it's a completely different context. The disciples had been arguing over which one of them was the greatest. And then they start complaining because someone was performing miracles in Jesus' name, but he wasn't one of the disciples. And Jesus could tell that his disciples were, become, were beginning to get infected by the cancer of ambition and arrogance. So he tells them in Mark 9, 43 to 48, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell. Where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It sounds a lot like what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. But he did add, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. So we need to be careful, not just with what our eyes see, not just with what our hands do, but also we need to be careful with where our feet go. And then the other thing that's different is that in Mark's gospel, he more strongly emphasizes the consequences of sin. So that brings us to the third thing Jesus says we need to do to escape sin, and that is remember the consequences of sin. In verse 30 he says, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And Mark adds, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And the word for hell here is the Greek word Gehenna. It was the name of a smelly, fiery garbage dump in the valley of Hinnon just outside the city of Jerusalem. It was a place that stunk to high heaven. It was at one time the place where children were brutally sacrificed in pagan worship rituals. Gehenna was a terrible, it was a despised place that no one wanted to get anywhere near, let alone spend any time there. And that's the image Jesus uses to describe hell. It's a real place. 
And it is more disgusting, it is more miserable than we could ever even imagine. But the worst part about hell won't be the presence of fire and brimstone. It's going to be the absence of God. The absence of hope. The absence of help or relief ever. And that's where sin leads. So Jesus says, better to lose an eye or a hand or a foot than spend eternity in hell. We need to face the fact that sin has drastic and long-lasting consequences. All sin. Now we might wish that Jesus never said this. We'd rather watch whatever we want to watch and do whatever we want to do. We'd rather go wherever we want to go without worrying about suffering any consequences. But Jesus doesn't beat around the bush here. He doesn't worry about being politically correct. He, he doesn't make up excuses about our sin being due to our heredity or our genetic makeup or anything like that. He was saying, listen, sin is dangerous. Stay away. At all costs, stay away. As it says in Numbers 32, 23. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. There's no such thing as just getting by with it. Your sin will find you out. You will suffer the consequences. So the next time sin comes knocking on the door of your heart, remember that sin originates not just when it is acted out, but when it is thought out. Remember that no matter how painful it may be to remove the problem areas from your life that, that are tempting you and leading you into sin, it's not nearly as painful to remove that as it is to suffer the consequences of leaving that in your life and down a path of sin. Don't wait to learn the hard way that the pleasure of sin is never, ever worth the eventual price. You must avoid it at any cost because you may be sure that your sin will find you out. If you don't believe that, just ask the drug addict who's living on the street now and whose family will no longer have anything to do with him. Or ask the guy who had an affair that completely destroyed his marriage and his family. Ask the woman that carries the regret of an abortion. Ask the former executive that lost it all because of his lust for fortune that led him to swindle and embezzle. These are people that learned the hard way that sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. It isn't worth it. The reward of sin is never as great as the regret. Not just in this life, but as Jesus pointed out, without repentance, sin ultimately has eternal consequences. Where the worm does not die, where the fire is never quenched, where all hope is forever lost, where prayer is never heard because God is not there. You are forever separated from God. The consequences of sin. Do you know who else understands the consequences of sin? Jesus. Jesus does. Even though he never sinned himself, he felt the consequences of our sin when he went to the cross. He felt the pain when that crown of thorns was jammed upon his head. He reaped the consequences when he was whipped 39 times. He felt the pain each step of the way as he carried his cross up Golgotha's hill. Can you imagine the pain he felt when they drove those nails through his hands and feet and hoisted him up on that cross to hang in agony for hours until he finally breathed his last? You can bet Jesus knows the consequences of sin because he suffered them on our behalf. And friends, that should be our greatest deterrent to ever sin. Jesus. 
We should be willing to rid ourselves of anything that would entrap us in sin after we realize all that Jesus did for us to free us from that trap. Because if we don't, that means Jesus just died in vain. He did all that for nothing. I don't know about you, but when I think about what sin will do to me, and when I look at what Jesus did for me, I don't want to be trapped in sin. I'm glad Jesus was direct enough to tell me how to avoid that trap and its consequences. Cut out anything in my life that's going to lead me down that path. This is a monkey trap. Raise your hand if you know how monkey traps work. Okay, a few of you do. All right. The way a monkey trap works is they will take the, the chain and they'll, they'll put the chain around a tree limb or maybe a, it's a longer chain than get around the trunk of a tree. And then they will fill this hollowed out shell with uh, some berries or maybe some shiny objects and they'll wait for the monkey to come by. And when the monkey comes by, he'll reach in to grab those berries or whatever's in there and he'll grab a hold of them. But when he goes to pull his fist out, he can't get it out. He's stuck because of his fist. Now all that monkey would have to do to be free is what? Open his hand. Let go. He could pull his hand right out and be free. But the monkey won't do it. He's trapped because he refuses to let go. So let me ask you this morning. What is it that you've been refusing to let go of? What is it that has you trapped in sin? Or is there something in your life that gives you an overwhelming desire to see something, to say something, to do something that God would not want you to see or say or do? Are you willing to remove whatever it is that's leading you down that path? Cut it off. It's better to lose whatever that is than to suffer the consequences of sin. So if you'll stand at this time. The challenge this morning is simple. Let go of whatever it is that's getting you trapped into sin. And instead hold on to the one who died to free you from sin. If you've got a decision to make this morning... If you, if you need to talk to someone about how you can get free from that, how you can cut that out of your life, if you need to talk to someone or have someone pray with you about anything else, or if you're ready to make a decision to invite Jesus into the throne of your heart, to take away your sin and to fill you with his presence and his forgiveness, then head over to our Next Steps prayer room this morning. Let someone talk with you, pray with you, and help you. Take whatever next step you need to take to be free, to let go, to cut out whatever it is that's leading you down the path of sin and to hold on to Jesus as your forgiver, your Lord and your Savior. So we head that way to the next steps room right now as I lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your forgiveness and for your grace. Father, we are so grateful that Jesus was up front with us and he told us exactly what we must do to rid ourselves from the trap of sin. And Father, although it can be painful to let go of certain things in our life that, that are leading us down the wrong direction, Lord, remind us of the consequences of sin. Remind us of the great love of Jesus who took the penalty of sin for us. So if we will just repent, if we'll just let go and hold on to you, we can be free of that. That no temptation is too great for us when we walk with you, when we let you help us. So Father, help us make those decisions today. If there's anyone here that needs to give their life to you, Lord, may they do that today. And we pray this in the powerful, forgiving name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated now as we prepare for a time of communion. Good morning. This morning in... Bible discovery, we talked about faith, and we talked about several definitions of faith. The one I 
liked the best, I think, was Hebrews 11 and 1. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then in class, we challenged the, the groups to come up with things we have faith in. And one of the things I've always had a lot of faith in is the food in Chicago. When we go visit my daughter and son-in-law and my grandson, you can almost always count on good food. Doesn't matter if it's Chinese, Mexican, whatever cuisine you want, it's good food. One time I went up there and we were, I don't know if we were on our way up, but anyway, Emily said, what do you guys want to eat tonight? And I said, I want mofongo. That's a Puerto Rican dish that you can only find almost in Puerto Rico, but I figured surely Chicago has a Puerto Rican community. So she got to digging around and she found me some mofongo. And it was the worst food I have ever eaten. The chicken wasn't creamy. The plantain wasn't crispy. And it was, in fact, I woke up the next morning not feeling very well. It was just terrible. And the moral of that story is this, is if you limit your faith to the things of this world, you're going to be disappointed a lot. And I still love the cuisine in Chicago, don't get me wrong. It's, it's really good food when you get in those bigger cities, and it's authentic. More authentic, I should say. But it leads me to, to the point that I want to make this morning is that we can have faith that Jesus is our rock, and we can have faith that he went to the cross for us and died for our sins that we would have a way to spend eternity with him. We can have faith that that is true. And when we go to communion, we're asked to remember Jesus and what he did for us. And I just, again, would like to share the, the scriptures this morning. If I can find them. Too many papers. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took up the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. So as we go to communion, let's remember Jesus. Let's do just what the scriptures tell us to do. Let's remember all the things he did for us, especially shedding his body and blood on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for loving us. I just pray that you'd open our hearts to the message Steve has given us and the beautiful music that we've heard today and just help us to take something from this lesson and this message today that we can use in our daily walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh,
Commitment Card Sunday. So I talked to Marianne, and we've already been receiving commitment cards over the past couple of weeks. So thank you to those who got, got, got theirs in early, and she's even told me that some of our former members have wanted to contribute to help us get this debt paid down. So if you're not familiar with what I'm referring to, uh, this building was built in 2009, and then again in 2014, and we still have some debt hanging around. Two families in the church have committed $150,000 to match contributions from everybody else. So we have a chance to put at least $300,000 against the debt. It'll knock one loan out and then the other one be paid down significantly. So on your way out, if you've not turned in a card or you don't have one, there's some on the back tables. Grab the card, complete it, drop it in the boxes, the offering boxes by the back. And then uh, Carol Dyward, our, our uh, financial secretary, will give us a total. And then we'll announce the total so far at uh, the annual meeting today. And then uh, we'll still take, if you haven't had a chance to come up with your number, pray about it, we'll still take contribution commitments through uh, December 1st. The contribution period begins then December 3rd and runs through the end of November next year and that'll allow us to get uh, some, some debt paid down. So I didn't mention this little matrix on the card and that's been in the bulletin. I just put some numbers together. If, if 40 households gave at those levels, we'd get to $150,000. Over 100 households have already given regular offerings this year at church. So that's not letting 60 of you off the hook. <laughs> It's, it's telling me I, I'm really uh, excited and believe that we can get to at least 150000 uh, through this ca uh, campaign. Steve. Thank you, Rob. And thank you all for being here to worship with us this morning, for visiting with us this morning. If you're here for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, please hang around. And we're going to, as soon as we dismiss here, we're going to convert this into a dining hall. We're going to roll out tables, put chairs around the tables going to roll out some food. We're going to have a great Thanksgiving themed meal. Uh, you're invited to join us for that. Uh, and then following the meal will be our annual meeting. We'd like uh, anyone who can, members in particular, but anyone else who's interested, hang around for our annual meeting. We'll uh, be talking a little bit about what's going on in the life of the church. Uh, we'll be having the vote for our officers for the coming year and for our general fund and missions budget. So please stay for the meal and then stay for a brief meeting after that. Uh, we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, please look at the announcements. They're, they're listed in your worship bulletin. Uh, so I'll let you look at those and be caught up on what's going on in the life of the church. So with that, let's stand and we will dismiss this portion of our time together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for the wonderful God you are, for the opportunity we've had today 
to lift our praise to you, to meet around the table and partake of the emblems celebrating the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that although sin is dangerous, it does not have to be victorious. You won the victory on the cross, Lord, and we thank you that there is a way out for us when we are tempted by sin. Lord, give us wisdom, give us strength through your spirit. Lord, we can't do it without you. So help us by your strength, Lord, to cut out those things in our lives and to live obediently for you. Lord, bless the rest of the time we have today. We ask you to bless our time of meal together and our, our meeting time later on today. And bless us, Lord, as we begin this uh, pay down to build up campaign, Lord, that your church might grow stronger through the process, that we might grow stronger through our faith and sacrificial giving. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.